Grace and peace to you in Jesus' wonderful name. My name is Michael Chauncey, and tonight we're studying John chapter 17. So let's go ahead and read the first verse, the first verse together, and then we'll pray. It says, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we are so grateful that our Creator, who made us in His own image, is our Redeemer, who saved us when that image was destroyed by sin. Lord, we thank you for your precious word, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and understanding, insight into the word of God so that our minds can be renewed, so that our hearts can be transformed, so that we can grow in grace and become more like Jesus. We ask all this in your holy name. Amen. Hey, God bless you tonight. Please open your Bible to John chapter 17. Read along with us as we go. Oh, and please hit the share button. Do it now. Uh, be a cyber missionary. It's such a blessing uh, that you're with us. Please hang on with us. Stay, stay with us throughout uh, this. It won't be long uh, study tonight, but let's go ahead. It says, these words spake Jesus. And by these words, he of course means the, the words in the preceding chapter, verses 31 through 33, Jesus said, the hour is coming when you'll be scattered. And these things I've spoken to me that in the world, in, the, in me you'll have peace, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And so that's what it means when it said, when Jesus had spoken these words. Then he lifted up his eyes and he prayed. So you could picture it. Jesus now has left the upper room. In the upper room, he had washed his disciples' feet. And then he predicted that Judas Iscariot would betray him. And then they ate the Last Supper together. Then Jesus gave them some uh, words of comfort and admonished them about the coming Holy Spirit. And then they left the upper room and we read about the discussion they, they were having between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's what happens in chapter 15 with the vine and the branches. Chapter 16, more about the Holy Spirit and coming persecution. And now chapter 17, Jesus' intercession for his disciples and his church. Father, the hour is come. Now, Jesus always said things like, my hour is not yet come in chapter 2. In chapter 4, the hour is coming and now is, uh, where he spoke of the coming, uh, coming time at, with the, of the Messiah's kingdom. And now he's speaking of the hour that has come for him to be glorified. Now, Jesus' glorification would be a three-step process. He would be crucified then he would rise from the dead, and then he would ascend back to the Father. And so uh, this glorification is in three steps, and that's what Jesus means by he says, my hour has come. Here he doesn't mean an hour of 60 minutes. What he means is this time that's been long awaited, prophesied in all of the scriptures, beginning with Genesis 3.15, that the serpent would... Uh, would his head would be crushed by the heel of the Messiah all the way to Malachi. Uh, all of the, test, the scriptures of the Old Testament prophesied of this time and not, now the hour has finally come and Jesus would be glorified by the Father and the Father would be glorified in the Son. Verse 2, as you have given him, that is the Son of Man, you've given the Son, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now, this is an interesting thought. Who has, those who God has given to Christ, whom has God given to Jesus? Now, that's an interesting question because this is something that's brought up back in John chapter 6, uh, verse... 
36, 636. Let me find this. Oh, 37. All that the Father hath given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Verse 37. It's talking about the fact that the Father gives certain people to Jesus. And here in verse 2 it says as uh, that, that, that Jesus would give eternal life to all that the Father has given to him. So in order for us to understand this, we need to go back to the Old Testament book of Psalms to understand what Jesus is talking about. Who are the people that God has given to Jesus? And so we're going to turn... To Psalm 2. It'll take me a while to turn there because I'm right in the middle of Job. <laughs> Let's turn over to Psalms. Here we are. Psalm 2. And it says in Psalm 2, verse 8, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. So who did the Father give to Jesus? Well, the heathen, the uttermost part of the earth, are his possession because he asked for them in prayer. Where does he ask? He asks right here in John chapter 17. Jesus' intercession for his people. So uh, this was a, uh, a, a an issue that Jesus dealt with during his life and in the early church, the earliest days of the early church, that they thought that the Messiah was only for the Jews, only for Israel. And then uh, when Cornelius uh, had that vision and Peter saw the vision, that Cornelius was the first uh, and his family were the first Gentiles to come to Christ. This was the beginning of the church starting to understand, oh, so God will save people from other nations, Gentile nations as well. And so that's what he means, as many as you have given him, people from all over the world. And so uh, that's what Jesus means by here, as many as you've given him, not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. Verse 3, and this is life eternal that they might know thee. What is eternal life? It's knowing Jesus, uh, knowing the Father. This is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We have eternal life by knowing God the Father and by knowing Jesus Christ. Now, this word knowing doesn't mean just head knowledge. The word, the Greek word here is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And it's a word that means the kind of knowledge that we know by experience, right? Uh, you could read all about Abraham Lincoln, but you've never met him because you didn't live during his time. Now, you could study up on everything he'd ever written or said or anything that was written about him, but you never met the man. Uh, Jesus says life eternal is knowing God and his son, Jesus Christ. The uh, unfortunate uh, thing is that the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in their Bible, they have a translation of the Bible, their own translation, and it says, and this is how we receive eternal life, by taking in knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. But we don't have eternal life by taking in knowledge. You can take in and absorb all kinds of knowledge, but eternal life comes from knowing, from knowing God and knowing Jesus. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus is saying, mission accomplished here. He's saying, I finished the work. Now, it will be uh, even more complete on the cross when he says the words, it is finished. But then there'll be even more of a completion when he ascends into heaven. And so it is finished, and I have finished the work up to the point that he was at, he had finished everything. Everything is what he's saying is everything is, is moving according to plan. Everything is right on schedule. I have glorified you on the earth and have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Jesus is reminding himself of his eternal existence 
with the Heavenly Father before creation. That's what we read about in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, part of the eternal Godhead before creation. And here, Jesus said, you will glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was. So Jesus existed before the world was. He was with the Heavenly Father. He was God along with the Heavenly Father and has eternally existed. Verse 6 says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. And so now he's talking about his 12 disciples, the, the men which thou gavest to me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them to me. And now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are from you. They now know. They now realize who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah, that he is the one who's come from God, and that all the miracles he did, uh, God was the source of those miracles. Verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which you gave to me. Once again, Jesus saying that he didn't speak of his own authority. What he told the apostles were the words he got directly from God the Father. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. So that was the mission, to convince these disciples that Jesus truly was God who had come in human flesh. And that mission has been accomplished. Verse 9, he said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which you have given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. What Jesus is saying is that uh, he and the Father uh, both have us in their hands. Jesus talked about it in John 10. He said, no one can snatch you out of my, my hand, and my Father is greater than all, and no one can snatch you out of my Father's hand. We are held in the hands of God the Father and Christ his Son. It says, all are mine, all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Jesus is glorified in the lives of his disciples, and now I am no more in the world. Jesus was still in the world, but what he was saying is that the time for his departure from the world was at hand. I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Jesus was speaking about his impending crucifixion, which would happen the following day. In fact, it would begin uh, that morning because uh, it's now evening. After that night, he would be on trial, then crucified the following day. And so he said, I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Now, this gives us an understanding of something. Some people have a lot of trouble understanding the Trinity because we know Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they see one, and when they we say that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one, uh, they can't understand that. That's just mathematically just mm, does something to their brain. But Jesus said that I come to thee, Holy Father, uh, keep through thy own name those whom you have given to me that they may be one as we are one. So the body of Christ is one body, but many members. That's what the Apostle Paul said. And so uh, I myself personally am not the body of Christ. I'm only a member of the body of Christ. But when the body of Christ 
Uh, we are all one, whether you're uh, a, a Baptist or a Methodist or evangelical or whatever uh, label you may put on yourself uh, as a Christian, uh, depending on where you fellowship in the body. Uh, all of that stuff, we're still one body in Christ because we've put our faith in him and uh, not in, in any labels uh, that the churches may have. And so we are one. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And the word kept here is a guarding type of word. I guarded them in thy name. <clears throat> and those that you've given me, I have guarded, and not one of them is lost, except for the son of perdition, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Jesus is saying, all the disciples, they're still, they're still with me. Even through all the persecution, they're with me. There'll come a time when they will be scattered abroad, according to chapter 16 and verse 32, but they're still with me except for one, and that's Judas Iscariot, but he's a fulfillment of prophecy. And we see that uh, all the way back in the book of Psalms, it was predicted that there would be a betrayer. There would be one who uh, ate bread with Jesus, but lifted up his heel against him. Verse 13, and now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus wanted uh, the disciples to hear this prayer. I'm speaking these things in the world so that they will have the fullness of my joy in them. And the Christian life is a joyful life. Paul told us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, it's funny when he tells us to rejoice like that, he was in prison at the time. Jesus knew the the, the trouble that was coming uh, to not only himself in his crucifixion, but also the persecution that his disciples would face. And yet he said, they will be full of my joy because the joy of the Lord will be your strength to endure even the worst persecutions that the enemy can uh, bring against the body of Christ. And he has had some real doozies over the centuries that uh, Christians who have endured persecution that that we, we can hardly fathom the things that they endured. And yet Christianity, there no one can take, Joyce, Jesus said it this way, and your joy no man shall take from you. Verse 14, I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they're not of the world even as I am not of the world. You know, the more true we are to the world, and let, let me say that right, the more true we are to God's word, the more strange we will be to the world. Peter said uh, that the, the people are going to think uh, there's something wrong with you when you don't run with them to the same uh, riotous lifestyle, and they'll speak evil of you. They'll hate you because you keep God's word. You keep his commandments. You're obedient to the Lord. And they just don't understand that. Verse 15, I pray that you would not take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. Don't take them out of the world, Lord, but keep them from being influenced by the evil of the world. That is an interesting thing that Jesus would pray. Jesus didn't call us to all uh, colonize some island where we keep ourselves far away from the evil influences of the world. He didn't tell us to all cloister ourselves in monasteries. I know that Christians throughout the centuries have lived in monasteries, many have, and uh, there's been some wonderful <laughs> uh, things that have come out of mon monastic writings and things down through the centuries. So I'm not, I'm not putting that down necessarily, but, but Jesus is saying, by and large, the Christian church is like salt on, on the meat. You know, we're scattered onto uh, the, the earth like salt on, on your, uh, on your uh, meal. You're the salt of the earth. And wherever we go, we are the influence, and we're not influenced. That should be the way that it is, that 
God doesn't take us out of the world, but he keeps us from the evil of the world. Then it goes on in verse 16 to say, they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Yeah, you know, this world uh, is not our home. Uh, we are not of the world, uh, just as Jesus was not of the world. Uh, sanctify them, he said, through thy truth, thy word is truth. And the word of God, it has a sanctifying effect on our lives. You know, the, again, I've given them thy word in verse 14, and sanctify them through your truth. We're to be different from the world. We're called to stand out as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, uh, Paul said in, in Philippians chapter 2. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Verse 18, as you have sent me into the world, even so I also have sent them into the world. God's gift of his son, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his son. Well, Christ so loved the world that he gave us, his church, to be the salt, to be the light of the world. And we're supposed to be in this world, but not of it. We're supposed to be uh, not taken out of the world, not to live cloistered and far away from the world, but we're to live among the people of this world, but being that salty influence of in this world. Verse 19, for your sake, for their sakes, he said, for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified through the truth. Jesus lived the example of the sinless, holy life. Tempted in every point, the book of Hebrews says, like we are, yet without sin. And so with us, the Bible says that we'll be tempted. In James chapter 1 and verse 12 says, every man is tempted. Even every Christian man is tempted. But we are called to live holy lives as Jesus did. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And here's the example. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, meaning these twelve apostles alone. Neither pray I for these twelve apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So by extension, Jesus' prayers for uh, all believers is what he's talking about here in John 17. He's not just praying for the 12, but for everyone who would come to believe in Christ through the written scriptures, the testimony of the apostles. Verse 21, that they all may be one. You know what? Jesus never intended for the body of Christ to be splintered apart. You know, uh, now, here's what happens. This is, this is the danger zone, okay? The danger zone of disunity is that somebody says, well, it's wrong to be part of a splintered off group, like being a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or an or a, a Anglican or a Lutheran or a Pentecostal or whatever. So uh, I'm going to splinter off even further and cre create a group that's not part of any of the groups. And what happens? Just further schism. No, what we should do is realize that it doesn't matter what label you wear, Baptist or Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian or whatever it may be, if you've given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've been born again by his spirit, then regardless of the label, you're my brother, you're my sister, we are one. And don't let the labels uh, make us think or behave otherwise. Now, this, are we always going to agree on every fine point of theology? No. Uh, why do we study verse by verse through the Bible? To bring unity to the body of Christ. Because that's why if, we, if I pick out a particular topic to talk about, and we talk about a particular topic, I'm going to probably end up accidentally cherry-picking verses that fit my narrative. But if we go through the verse Bible verse by verse and let it speak for itself, well, that's going to bring unity because we all believe in all of the scriptures. You know, it's funny that I have Christians of other denominations, other groups 
that may disagree with a particular point of view, they toss scriptures at me trying to correct my thinking. And all I can do is say amen to the scriptures. I already believe in those scriptures. I already knew the scripture before they posted it. Uh, they're thinking that they're posting some scripture that's going to radically change the way I think. It won't because I've been knowing that scripture for 40 years and have loved that scripture and believe in it and preach it and live by it. Um, the reason it doesn't change my mind to their point of view is because uh, they're interpreting it in a way that probably doesn't really fit its context or meaning. And so uh, the unity, it's not going to come by us pulling ourselves further away from each other. It's going to come by us ignoring all of the titles, all the colors, all the cultural differences, uh, the fact that some people sing uh, out of the red book and some people sing out of the blue book, and it doesn't really matter. What, we, what unites us is if we've been given a new heart and a new spirit and have become a new creation in Christ. And so, verse 21, probably the key text to this entire chapter, that they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And that's where we're united. We're not united necessarily in every finer point of biblical interpretation. But what we're united in is we're united in Christ and the Father, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The world will never believe that Jesus is truly the Messiah as long we're, as we're splinted, divided, and throwing darts at one another. Jesus said the world will, he, God wants, Jesus wants us to be one so that the world will believe that Christ has been sent by God. Verse 22, in the glory which thou gavest me, I gave to them that they may be one even as we are one. You see, that, you, that oneness of God is not a, a singular one uh, so that it, uh, people who deny that the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are one, uh, they deny, some people deny that, but they don't understand that, that God, the Godhead is one in the same sense that God wants us to be one. All right. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. That's God's real desire. Christ's real desire is that the church be perfect in one. In fact, that's how we become mature. Perfect here. The Greek word teleos means to come to maturity, to come to reach completion. And so unity in the body is what he's talking about. And he says that the world may know that you sent me and have loved me, them just as much as you've loved me or even as thou hast loved me. So we are loved. We're loved by God and we should love one another that way. You think God loves one Christian more than another Christian because he, he uh, goes to one church or another church? See, this church over here, up the uptown church that's, uh, you know, got the, the taller steeple. God loves them any more than he loves the, the church across town that's maybe not so fancy. You know, that has nothing to do with it, does it? It just seems silly when we look at it that way. Father, I will that they whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Jesus is looking forward to the day when the church is with Christ in heaven. And that's what is being spoken of here in verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am so that they can behold my glory which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. This verse 24, one more witness that Jesus is the eternally existing son of God. Some people don't know that. They don't realize that Jesus existed before all of creation. Do you know what that means? That Jesus was not a created being, but he himself is the uncreated creator of all things. So Jesus is not a creature of God that God made. 
and he he was loved with God before the foundation or before the creation of the world. And when we uh, when we're with Christ in heaven, in His presence, when we're absent from this body and present with the Lord, then we'll see we will behold His glory. Verse twenty five: O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee. But I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And so the perfect knowledge of God comes through this relationship with Christ, believing that he is the one God sent, believing that he is the Messiah. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, here's an interesting point. Uh, as we go through John 17, we notice something that he calls God a particular name always. Father. In verse 1, he calls him Father. And in uh, verse 24, he calls him Father. In verse 25, he calls him O righteous Father. And in verse 21, he calls him Father. Uh, so the word Father is used again and again. Verse 5, Father. And so all these times that he calls him Father, and then he says, I have declared unto them thy name. And now in the context here, we have to understand that the name that Jesus is declaring to them is the name Father. Abba, Father. Uh, some people have thought that the name that Jesus revealed as the Father's name is Jesus, but that's not true. Jesus is the name of the Son, and it's not applied to the Father. Over and over, he keeps saying, I've declared unto them thy name. And what name did he use? In this context, it was always Father. So some people say, well, Father's not a name. It's a title. Well, <laughs> That's a mistaken, mistaken understanding of the Greek. In the Greek, name and title is the same thing. There is no title and name difference, no distinction. What you call something is its name. And so that's what he's talking about when he says name. So you may run into a person at some point that denies the Trinity. And they uh, believe that being one, that Jesus is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And they even forbid people to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just as the Bible says in Matthew 28, 19, they say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aren't names. Well, Jesus right here over and over calls God the Father, Father. And then he says, I've declared thy name unto my brethren. And the name he has declared is Father. Simple as that. Well, praise the Lord. We've gone all the way through this wonderful chapter. Jesus' prayer for his 12 apostles, but then he said, not for these only, but for all those that will believe through their word. And so he was praying for us, praying primarily for what? That we Christians would be one. That doesn't mean that we all have to pull away from our church denominations and, and give up being a Methodist or Baptist or Episcopal or Lutheran or whatever you are. But what we have to do is recognize that whether you are Episcopal or Methodist or Baptist or Lutheran or Assembly of God or whatever you may be, uh, that we are one. We're one with one another because our hearts have been made new by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been made new in him. That they all may be one in us. That's what Jesus said. Now let's turn our hearts to the gospel. The gospel is this. God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins, for you, because he loves you that much. And not only did Jesus die on the cross for your sins, he was buried and he rose again the third day. And if you will repent and believe the gospel, God will forgive your sins and give you the free gift of eternal life. What does it mean to repent? You know what it means. It means to turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive our sins and cleanse us.
from all unrighteousness. But it's not enough just to confess it. Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. And so let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord. Have mercy and to our God, and he will abundantly pardon. Praise God. As far as the east is from the west, he'll remove our transgressions from us and make us new. He'll give us a new heart and a new spirit. And make us new creations in Christ. Old things passed away. All things become new. So that's what it means to repent. The next part was to believe the gospel. What does it mean to believe the gospel? It means to put all of your trust in what Jesus did for you. When he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Pray with me, won't you? Let's just pray together. Dear God, I need you. Lord, I admit it. I'm a sinner. I've broken your commandments and I've broken your heart. I repent of my sin, Lord. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin, that he rose again from the dead on the third day. I believe Jesus is risen. He is alive and he is Lord. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Forgive my many sins. Cleanse me. Change me and make me a new creature in Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I'll have the strength to take up my cross daily and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. I hope you prayed with me just now. If you did, listen, the Bible says that all the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. But really, that's just the first step in... The Christian life, it's a, it's a whole new life, and it really it's a relationship with God. The next step is to ask God to lead you to a good Bible-believing church. Tell the pastor there that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Ask him to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, just like the Bible says in Matthew 28, 19. Now, I also want to encourage you to start reading God's Word every day. Even if it's just a small portion of Scripture, the Scripture says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. If you can do it, gather the whole family together, especially if you've got any little kids. Make it a special time where you invite God's presence and peace to fill your home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the kind of a commitment that every Christian family must make if they're going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, we do this Bible study verse by verse every day where we take a chapter, we Read and study every verse, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, and word for word. Why do we do it that way? Because we want to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of our lessons are on a separate Facebook page called Verse by Verse Through the Bible with Michael Chauncey. They're also on our new YouTube page which is also called Verse by Verse Through the Bible. Please search that, find it verse by verse through the Bible. You'll see my picture on every video, just like this. It's the same videos, but go there, subscribe to the videos and share them on social media. Share them to uh, the link to Twitter, share it to YouTube, share it to Facebook, share it to on emails, just be a cyber missionary. Send it all around the world. Uh, and people will grow in the Lord. And God will bless you for uh, helping us to sow his word. God bless you and may the peace of Christ be with you.